Are men supposed to be tough or tender? Welcome to Grace and Truth. On this podcast today, I am joined by my dear friend, Josh Bice. He is the senior pastor of Praise Mill Baptist Church and the president and founder of G3 Ministries. He recently wrote an excellent article for G3 called Do Not Believe the Lies About Masculinity. My name is, in fact, Owen Strand. I'll be the host of this episode. Please subscribe to, like, and download the podcast on all platforms. Josh, with those things said, welcome to Grace and Truth. Good to be with you, Owen. Thank you for making time for us. I believe you're doing some retreat stuff. You're 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 building and dreaming and scheming, uh, but you have uh, made time for this humble podcast. So I appreciate you doing so. Yeah, always happy to be with you. Yeah. So I want to talk to you today about your article. Uh, do not believe the lies about masculinity. Uh, as we do so, though, you and I have talked a little bit. Just you know, getting to know each other over the years about your background. It's always important, I think, to hear about how fathers and sons connected, what your background is or lack thereof. Uh, I know you are, are close uh, with your father, so tell us about your dad just uh, just at the outset here. Yeah, yeah. So my earliest memories of life, Owen, were really tumultuous. Uh, my my dad and mom they were pagans. They you know I was. I was conceived out of wedlock. My parents married soon thereafter. And, um, you know, my earliest memories were just fights and problems and, and that sort of thing. Um, they ended up uh, divorcing. Um, I was about five years of age at that time. Um, had a really, really horrible stepfather that entered the scene. He was abusive to my mom, abusive to me. So my earliest memories of life were uh, filled with confusion about what home life you know should look like, what manhood should look like. Um, but I did see that you know as I was looking through the fog of confusion, there were two men in my life that would step in and that would 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 really in many ways come to be heroes to me. And that was my father and my grandfather. And so my mom's dad, my grandfather, and then of course my dad, would be great influences on my life. Now, uh, providentially so, my, my grandfather was already a Christian, but my dad was not. And soon thereafter, he would become a Christian. And so I would see what manhood looked like through that lens. Um, although very confused as a boy, I would soon you know, come to see these men be rock solid examples of what it means to be a man. So uh, my grandfather was a construction worker. Um, he was in the army. And then, of course, he drove a truck for a while and then started a construction business that was very successful. And so I grew up seeing him. And then, of course, my father was a fireman. And so I grew up hanging out around the fire department, climbing on the back of fire trucks and that sort of thing. Um, but those two men really greatly influenced me. Uh, my dad, still to this very day, my grandfather's with the Lord, but my dad is still uh, very much a part of my life and my children's lives and and really in many ways is a close friend, although the relationship is still, you know, father and son, but really in many ways a close friend of mine. We've traveled the world together. We've climbed mountains together. We've, you know, gone big game hunting together, fishing you know, all sorts of things. And so he's, he's really a great influence on my life. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. It's very interesting to hear you talk about some of the challenges in your background, because I think folks, uh, some folks out there who might be critical of uh, the standpoint you and I have regarding manhood, strong manhood, let's call it anchored in scripture, strong biblical manhood. Um, they, they might think that um, men of our type, you know, we're from the lines of uh, kings, and we've only seen men throw their authority around, and we want to be like them, and 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 we just want to have control of everybody in our environment. We've never we've never had any hardship or suffering in our lives, but I really appreciate you sharing that because it sounds like you you honestly have seen how masculine strength can can go awry and cannot be used well, and, and that shaped you and and pushed you by the grace of God into wanting to be a strong, godly man. Is that accurate? Oh, absolutely. I mean, obviously, masculinity is not the problem. Sin is the problem. And so that goes, 
you know, across the board. So you could talk about femininity in the same way. And so it's not that being feminine is the problem for women. It's, it's sinful influences that take it in a direction that God would never intend. And the same thing is true with masculinity as well. Yeah, you say this in your article at G3, men leading and women submitting to robust masculine leadership should never be seen as oppressive and harmful for women. The strongest and most capable Christian women feel most secure and free to use their gifts in the life of the church when they're led by strong, robust men who take the life of the church seriously. The feminist movement perpetuates a lie that it liberates women when in all reality it leads to more and more bondage. If you look at the world, the places where women are the most liberated and free is where the gospel has taken root and the fruit of Christianity results in masculine, dare I say, patriarchal leadership is prevalent in the sphere of the home, the church, and the culture. Would you say that vantage point that you just staked out, which I wholeheartedly affirm, is popular in even Christian circles today? Do you sense that let me, let me sharpen the question this way. Do you think the younger generation gets what you're after there and agrees? Or do you think the younger generation in the church that you're seeing rejects that? Yeah, I think that in many healthy churches, perhaps they would see that and agree with that. But I do believe that there's a, a great number of evangelical Christians that have been influenced. And I don't think that they realize how much they've been influenced, but they've been influenced by a social justice movement, uh, the Me Too movement, the Church Too movement, all of these various different movements that have impacted the church. But, you know, various waves of the feminist movement have influenced the way we think about, you know, roles and responsibilities of men and women in the life of the church and the life of the home and even the life of the secular sphere. And when we think about that, when we see it, I think that, you know, for us, I mean, I grew up in a, in a context where, you know, complementarianism was, was really in many ways uh, championed. But if I'm honest, I look at, at the influences of the feminist agenda and we're seeing it come our way through, you know, articles on the New York Times or even messages from Scooby-Doo. Uh, to, to try to influence children at a young age that masculinity in and of itself is toxic, it's dangerous. And so I really think that healthy churches probably get it, but a vast number of Christians, I believe, are influenced in a negative fashion through the liberal agenda of the feminist movement and ideologies. Yeah, you talk in your G3 article, Do Not Believe the Lies About Masculinity, that everybody should read about what you just said, a cartoon from um, Mystery Incorporated, where one character describes the actions of a man as uh, falling prey to toxic masculinity. And you just recognize that really nothing is, is safe. I'm not sure, of course, that things have ever been truly safe in American culture, as if there's no worldview out there. But wow. Um, you know, the, the tip of the spear is even sharper than it used to be. You've got kids learning a phrase like toxic masculinity. I, I think what I would say, um, in very much agreeing with what you just laid out, uh, I, I think young men, you know, they, they want to be strong. Boys are born wanting to be strong. They want you to, when they're five years old, come over and feel, feel their bicep. Their bicep is basically non-existent, but they want you to feel it nonetheless. They want to be tough and, uh, so I think there is a real, there's a real crossing point, uh, a fork in the road for young men in particular today, where they can either buy the lies that you've sketched out here, the woke feminist lies that they are toxic for being aggressive or assertive, or they can say, no, I shouldn't, I really shouldn't be sinful and wicked and unburden myself and, and use my strength against women and children. But I actually think I am called to strength uh, biblically. How would you push a young man watching this and listening to this to grow in godly strength? What would you say to him? Yeah, a couple of things. First of all, we need to recognize that, you know, male characteristics are not the problem. You know, little boys are born with this innate desire to be like their fathers or grandfathers. And sometimes, you know, uh, if they have no father in their life and they look to an uncle or someone else, but but they they recognize from an early age that they're different from their sisters or from their cousins or from even their mothers. 
they're just built differently and they have different desires. I mean, little girls want to, you know, sit and talk about things or play with little dolls and that sort of thing, you know, and then boys, they want to wrestle and they, there's a ruggedness that's just built into their DNA. They should not run from that. Um, and I think that we should see as the church that there's this agenda in the culture that wants to make little boys behave like little girls. But the flip side is true as well, where we have uh, this agenda to make little girls want to be like little boys. And so we're seeing this in, you know, Nike commercials or Gatorade commercials where you have girls suiting up to go play football or getting in the ring to fight MMA battles, you know, and so it, it's problematic. There's a, a massive gender confusion when we look at our culture. But when it comes to masculinity, little boys should not be shamed because they want to wrestle in the floor or they want to play, you know, contact sports or they want to arm wrestle or whatever it may be. They should not be shamed into believing that that's somehow toxic or it's wrong. It isn't. Uh, but again, there's something different in the Christian sphere that we need to be aiming for. And it's not just the ruggedness or having dirt under the fingernails or, learn, or, or learning how to fight like a man. Um, we actually need to be aiming for, you know, this idea of biblical manhood, which means that it's something more than being able to bench press 300 pounds or climb a mountain or dunk a basketball. We need to be thinking about what it means to be provider and protector of a woman, specifically our wives or our children. And that's different than just the rugged masculinity that we see that's natural by birth. Uh, what comes through the second birth, uh, spiritually speaking, is a desire for a man biblically to protect his wife spiritually and to provide for his wife spiritually and his children and his home. And so that's, again, what we should be aiming for, not running from the characteristics of, you know, masculinity or what it means to be a man or, you know, in the sense of a little boy seeing that that male characteristic in his life, but also as a man modeling in the life of his home for his son to see this is that to be a biblical man, biblical manhood is, is something even more than that. And so we should, we should model that as men as well. Yeah, that's a really good balance. And I, I think you've got the balance uh, really nicely calibrated in the article and in your ministry in general, um, just as your friend, because we're not saying uh, it's an either or here. We're not saying that you, you need to you know, do all the physical stuff and thus you recover your manhood in a context that hates manhood or you know, you start leading your family spiritually and trying to provide for your wife and protect your family spiritually. We're actually both of us, I think, in our own different ways, um, but very much complimentary, saying the same thing. We're saying you do both. You, you do try to train your son into manhood. He may or may not be the starting outside linebacker for the high school or whatever. OK, you know, um, that's not necessarily probably in the strand bloodline. I won't speak to the vice bloodline, but, you know, he, he may not be in that position. But I'm still trying to give him a taste for outdoor stuff and physical contact and and hard things and physical challenges and these sorts of things. But you better um, you better be very much assured that I'm not teaching him that, you know, catching the winning touchdown is the emblem of his manhood. His manhood ultimately is grounded in the scripture. It's grounded in spiritual strength. It's grounded in Christ. That's what men most need. There's men all around us, though, Josh, today who have turned to online gurus and coaches and impressive physical athletes and these sorts of things. And I think they're getting something of um, some common grace wisdom uh, about manhood. And, and that's not so bad. That can be good to a degree. But they're not getting the sum and substance of biblical manhood. You're not going to get that from an Instagram video of a guy walking slow-mo past a Ferrari. You, you've got to get to the scripture. How do you, in your context in Georgia at Praise Mill, how are you trying to help uh, a lot of young men uh, who are from divorced homes, who are who are from homes where dad wasn't that plugged in? What are, what are you doing um, to try to strengthen them in this strange day? Yeah, well, I mean, even in our own local church context, what we try to do is we, you know, we have men's groups that meet together. And so we try to talk about this, to be honest with one another about the, the challenges that we face in our homes, the challenges that we face, you know, in terms of the cultural ideas that are very much prevalent 
like a barrage coming to us uh, through different, you know, uh, messaging that might come through social media or movies or whatever it might be. We just see it all around us. And so there's a desire to weaken men and to uh, really in many ways take, you know, men from this masculine, robust, strong provider, protector mentality, and then move them to sort of the middle of the road to more of a gender neutral sort of form of what masculinity looks like. I think we need to be honest uh, about this agenda. And then we need just to teach what the Bible says. You know, what does the Bible say about Adam and Eve from the garden? What does the Bible say about manhood in the, in the sense of leadership roles and responsibilities in the home as well as the church? So just driving the men in our church to the Bible and to say, this is what the Bible teaches. And so we should never be ashamed to align ourselves with the text of Scripture. And that's the main thing, you know, but again, to your point earlier, every, every young boy is not like cut from the same cloth and he doesn't come out of this, this common mold, you know, certain boys are going to grow up and, you know, and they're going to see themselves as shorter than other boys or bigger than other boys. And, and so it shouldn't be that we should say every little boy is going to grow up and be just the same as the next man. Because some men, quite frankly, don't want to hunt big game and skin deer or elk or moose or whatever it might be. Um, and they're more, you know, driven to numbers and, you know, they might, you know, find themselves sitting in a cubicle and crunching numbers as a CPA. Does that mean that they're somehow to be shamed as lesser than some other man that might like contact sports or, you know, he might enjoy big game hunting or fishing or outdoors? No, that's not the... The, the point at all. Uh, so what we need to see is that is that the Bible teaches that this is what manhood looks like. And we need to be driven to the text of Scripture and say, well, we need to be providers and protectors of our wives and our families. So a guy that sits in a cubicle or a football coach, they're different but both of them should actually be willing to get up in the middle of the night and go to the living room if they hear something that might be an intruder. They shouldn't send their wives down to check it out. But even beyond that, uh, we need to be thinking in terms of how we're providing and protecting our wives spiritually in, in sense of you know, providing sound biblical theology and resources in the home and leading in family worship. And, and so this idea of toxic masculinity infiltrating the church if anyone should push back against it it definitely should be the christians and we should see it for what it is yeah i couldn't agree more um how have you seen having children over the years um uh, change you soften you uh work on you you know this is it's it's one thing for for us to talk through these things and and, uh, and and stake it all out and lay it out on paper and these sorts of things. We've got to do that. But just give us a little sense. Give me give me a little window into, um, you know, like, for example, I've seen on your on your Instagram before we've talked about it. But, you know, once in a while, there's like a, a celebratory sort of Atlanta Braves dance party or some sort of some sort of madness. I can't quite tell what it is that goes on in the vice home. I love that because I see the theological yeah. seriousness, but then I see a dad having fun with his kids. Talk to us about that angle as well in your home. Yeah. Yeah. The, the word madness might be a good descriptor <laughs> for it at times for sure. But, but nevertheless, uh, yeah, I mean, I think children coming into the, to the home and to your life as a man will enable you to experience the heights of all emotions, both laughter and, you know, sadness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you will, you will celebrate in ways that you perhaps have never celebrated before at the birth of your son or daughter. Mm -hmm. And when they, uh, have wonderful achievements in their lives, then you celebrate with them with the heights of emotions of joy, but then there are disappointments too, and, uh, problems of sickness or even death mm -hmm. that will take you to places where you never dreamed that you would go. And so I think that to be a man doesn't mean that you can't laugh and you can't experience joy and you can't experience the freedoms of what it means to celebrate. Um, you just have to be serious all the time. Um, but then of course, at the same time to be a faithful man doesn't mean that you can't weep 
Because again, if you just look to Jesus, you see Jesus coming to the tomb of Lazarus and he weeps. And you see, you know, the, you know, real genuine emotion even there in Jesus in his humanity. And I think that for us to say that, you know, to be a strong man means that you can never be sad or you can never show your emotions. That's certainly incorrect. Um, we need to be men who weep over sin. You know, when we see sin in our lives, it, it should bring us to tears. Mm. Or when we're, you know, praying for unconverted friends and family members to weep over unconverted souls is a good thing. Um, but again, there should not be, you know, to be tender is one thing, but to be feminine is something different. We need to, you know, be able to differentiate between the two categories. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I one element of your article, do not believe the lies about masculinity that I really appreciated um, was you talking about weeping as a result of conviction of sin. You say this, as we read and survey scripture, we find that men weep when they're confronted with their own sinfulness. While we should resist the idea of being overly sensitive and weeping at the drop of a hat, amen, I agree. We should likewise resist the idea of becoming calloused and unmoved by our sinful flesh, Paul wrestled through this in Romans 6 to 8 as he looked at his own struggles in the body of sin. And then you go on to talk about how Peter, when confronted uh, by Christ with his sin, his denial of Christ three times just prior to the crucifixion of Jesus, went out and wept bitterly, Luke twenty two sixty two. 62. What an important word. And I would say that is a minor software update on strong manhood that probably our generation uh, is making that our maybe fathers and grandfathers generation, probably grandfathers more, some of our father's generation got too much into the weeping stuff. But, you know, our grandfathers, you could almost have that sense, uh, not to speak for everyone's grandfather out there, but just in general that, you know, you almost weren't ever supposed to show softness or tenderness or, or emotion. There wasn't anything really to cry about. Some men had grandfathers who did. Others, I think, had men who just didn't show a lot of love on the one hand, didn't say I love you to their kids ever and also never showed any vulnerability, you could definitely overdo it. I would say we've seen some overdoing it of the emotional thing in America in recent decades. I, I think our generation is trying, by the grace of God, to do some correction here and say, no, 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 we're not going to be, you know, leaky faucet, you know, weeping every three hours or something over a cut fingernail. Uh, we're not going to outweep our wives. However, um, we're going to show some emotion in good ways, healthy ways, when it's appropriate. So I really appreciated that emphasis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to uh, ask you a question beginning to wind down here, but one of the things I see in your life and ministry in terms of your, your own um, demonstration of godly manhood is that you're a very steady man. So you've already talked about your background some, uh, but you strike me as a man who um, you set the course uh, you know, the Star Trek Enterprise, and you just go through it, man. It like, like you've, you know, that it's mapped out, and we're going to keep going. And there's going to be some highs and lows, as you talked about, even in the family sense, probably in the ministry sense as well, for both of us is true. But I'm going to keep going. Where would you say you picked up that trait? Because it stands out to me, just a real steadiness and dependability in an age that doesn't have a whole lot of that. Yeah, I mean, Obviously, I, I mentioned my grandfather and my father as influences on my life in a tremendous way. My grandfather was in the military. He was a very disciplined man. Um, never really remember seeing my grandfather weep, uh, but I, I did sense a tenderness at times in him. But he was a very rugged, strong man. Um, my father um, obviously uh, influenced me greatly. Uh, but again, my dad, although I was never in the military, my father was never in the military. His dad was in the military. I never met my grandfather on my dad's side. My, my, my dad's father passed away when he was a young boy. Um, but, but he was um, in the military and he was also a, a pastor. And so he was disciplined. But my dad also got me involved in running. And so I remember early on, um, you know, long distance running. So I ran cross country and track and learned disciplines, um, you know, early on in as a boy. And then, of course, competed in high school and then college and then went beyond that and started running marathons. 
and ran ultra marathons with my dad. Uh, the year that I was married, I was 10th overall in the Atlanta Marathon. That's the uh, 1996 Olympic course there in Atlanta. And then went on to compete, um, you know, at 50 kilometer races, 50 mile races. But my dad went on and he, he did a couple of 100 mile races. And so we've spent a lot of hours on rugged trails in the mountains and just training together and just learning that helped me. I think, uh, honestly, as I think back to just gospel ministry, um, you know, sometimes in, in church life and in gospel ministry, you can just really go through some dark valleys that, that aren't quick to, you know, disappear. Uh, you know, it, it takes sometimes maybe, five, 10 years to work through some dark valleys in ministry. And so early on, I just really committed myself that I'm going to persevere through the difficulties. I'm not going to go from church to church and just hop around from, you know, this church for two years. And then when it gets hard, I'm going to go to another church for two years and that sort of thing. So I just committed myself that I'm going to, in the same way that I've endured pain you know, in distance running, I'm going to learn to do that in ministry as well. And then I look to the Apostle Paul as a massive example as he talks about this sort of thing uh, in his own ministry as well. So those were influences that really impacted me. So my grandfather, my dad, and then, of course, the Apostle Paul. And then I could talk to you about church history, too, figures from church history that in many ways endured to the very end through trials and difficulties as well. Yeah, we were on a Reformation tour uh, about six weeks ago from the recording of this podcast in December 2023. My brain, it's been a little hard returning to ordinary life, frankly, Josh, because I think part of my brain and part of my my heart is back there in the UK. Um, yeah. A lot of what we got to do, um, thanks to your your kindness and your leading of the G3 UK Reformation tour, was talk about honestly, men who persevered through ferocious difficulty and left a faithful witness to Jesus Christ, even under duress, even at the expense of their very life itself. Give, give us one, give us one figure, um, even as you've reflected on uh, following the trip, uh, who really has impacted you in, in that respect. Yeah, I mean, if you just think about that trip, obviously there's so many you could you could go to. Um, I mean, I, th I think of Knox. I think of his his faithfulness, his steadfastness. You could go to the martyrs there in Oxford as well. Um, when I think about the martyrs, although Knox himself wasn't a martyr, he endured you know a lot of difficulty and trials and pressures you know from from his own day in ministry, but. The martyrs themselves, you think about, you know, you think about Cranmer, you think about Nicholas Ridley, you think about these guys that were, were brought to the stake. You think about a John Rogers at Smithfield on the outskirts of London that, you know, came to the stake and he sees his wife and his children for the last time, uh, 11 children, the youngest of which was, was born when he was in prison. And he sees his youngest child for the first time and the last time at that march to the stake. Uh, I read one account of this story, which really impacts me, that says that his wife, and this tells you a little bit about the steadfastness of his wife. She embraced him as the children and with the children, really in many ways to encourage John Rogers as he was on his way to the stake. And when she embraced him, she knew that he would be given one final opportunity to recant there when he got to the stake. And so when she embraced him, she said to him in, in a, in, in really like whispering this in his ear was that uh, whatever you do, do not recant. And so just the steadfastness of a figure like this, who was, he was not being martyred. He was not being burned at the stake because of his translation work in the old Testament. He, you know, although he did finish Tyndale's work, what he was being burned at the stake for was his resistance and his unwillingness to embrace the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. So in many ways, it was the doctrine of the Lord's table that he was willing to give his life for. 
And so it, it's, it's an individual like Rogers or the Oxford Martyrs that really speaks to me and encourages me to think about in our own present day, the difficulties that we have in many ways don't really compare to that, but they are real and they are difficult. And we see in them the characteristics of faithful biblical manhood, what it means to persevere all the way to the very end. Amen. Very well said. That was very powerful. Yeah. And we still have these temptations, actually, and challenges from the Catholic Church, even into the current current day. Uh, Pope Francis has recently announced that he's granting a plenary indulgence if you pray in front of a nativity scene. Again, I repeat myself, a plenary indulgence, literally the issue that kicks off the Reformation. And so we're not seeking to be, you know, angry uh, men, as we've talked about, we want to be balanced men. We want to be men of conviction, but we absolutely want to stand steadily and unflinchingly, even as these issues still, almost 500 years later, are everywhere around us and people are running to hell, believing that um, what the Catholic Church is offering them is true salvation when it it is all a mirage. It is a fake salvation. It it is a pathway that if you follow, you will only uh, you will only end up in destruction, eternal destruction, hell. And so it's a, it was amazing to me. Here we were talking about all these you know sites from 400, 500 years ago from the Reformation. All these faithful men, these faithful women, love that. How you brought out a complementarian marriage there, a, a godly marriage where it's not just the man striving to be faithful and strong. It's it's a godly woman who is right there beside her husband, who is strengthening him. And isn't that a picture of a woman being a helper? Anyway, got a lot on the table here, but we can't we can't um, laud the men of the past all under the grace of God, um, but then fail to show up for our shift. So I'm very thankful for you as we wrap that you are a faithful, steady, convictional, balanced man. I love that story. Oh. Thanks, so. Owen. Yeah, man, we can learn much from these figures from church history. And I think that if we're if we're honest, we look at ourselves and we see our own weaknesses and the weaknesses of the flesh. Mm -hmm. But it, it really, in many ways, serves us as an encouragement to look to the text of Scripture to see that, you know, these examples like a Rogers or the Oxford Martyrs, th these guys, they stood on the shoulders of those gone before them. And we read, you know, Hebrews 11, for instance, and then you 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 look at the uh, at the life of the Apostle Paul and others in the scriptures as examples for us to be faithful, unflinching in this day and age of compromise, men of God who refuse to throw in the white towel. Yeah. Amen. If you've been listening to this discussion, this excellent discussion, my dear friend Josh Bice, here's one further word for you. Josh is professor of preaching at Grace Bible Theological Seminary, where the global headquarters of the Grace and Truth broad, uh, uh, podcast are. You're, uh, we're literally broadcasting live from the global headquarters of Grace and Truth. In, in all seriousness, Josh is uh, going to be teaching preaching, expository preaching at GBTS uh, in just a few months. Uh, for us, it's his it's his first class for us, and we're really excited about it. He is a full fledged faculty member at GBTS. So, Josh, um, I'm looking forward to that class. And and uh, just a closing word: What would you say to any men who might be hearing this and thinking, I don't know if I should jump into the seminary waters? Do you have any kind of nitro boost for them as we as we take it out here? Absolutely. Let's let let's let's go. Let's do this together. Come join us. We would love to dive into the classroom and talk about expository preaching, learn how to rightly divide the word of God. Uh, obviously, if we're going to be faithful men in the pulpit, we need to learn and to be sharpened with this endeavor. Of course, this responsibility to handle the word of God properly, not only in the sense of faithful pastors and elders who are leading in the in the life of the church, but also in the home. And so I would mm -hmm. I would heavily encourage anyone listening to this podcast that wants to come and learn how to preach the word and to teach the word rightly then come and and uh, join us at GBTS as we dive into expository preaching. And that linkage of character and then preaching excellence uh, in, in terms of faithfulness primarily to the text, that's the heart. That's the heartbeat um, because we need, we need men who are not just skilled in exegesis. We do need that, and you are very much that as a, as a godly man. But we need the man to have 
godly character. We need steady men in unsteady times. Uh, we need faithful men. We need convictional men. We need men of grace and joy. That's what my friend Josh Bice is, as we've seen today. Josh, thank you so much for joining me on Grace and Truth today. My privilege, Owen. Yeah. Everyone out there, thank you for watching and listening. Uh, this is Grace and Truth. Please subscribe to, like, and download the podcast on all platforms. And remember, there is grace and truth in one name and one name only. And that name is Jesus Christ. John one seventeen. God bless you.